the land of enchantment with a problem on its hands. Crime affecting nearly every part of life in New Mexico. We're not safe anywhere from gun violence. Transforming once vibrant streets and changing lives forever. But when you lose someone so close to you, your whole world stops. You've told us it's New Mexico's biggest problem. We're listening and are teaming up to do something about it. KOAT Action 7 News, the Albuquerque Journal, and News Radio KKOB. This is Partners for Impact. Crime Solutions. Here's Doug Fernandez. We are at the African American Performing Arts Center at Expo New Mexico. I'm with representatives from business, law enforcement, other community members, and those fighting for victims of crime. They're here because they agree with so many of you. Crime in New Mexico is out of control and you want answers. The problem touches everyone. He died because a kid made a stupid mistake and made a stupid decision and was in a place that he had no business being in. And he had a gun that he had no business having. Lives taken one at a time or more. Police responding to a mass shooting in Farmington. At least three dead and several more hurt, including two officers. According to the most recent FBI data, New Mexico ranks second in the country in violent crime per capita, trailing only Washington, D.C. New Mexico also second in assaults and kidnappings, third in homicides. The problem is not just taking lives, but also suffocating businesses that have been around for decades. The shooting on Mother's Day that happened right next to us drew the final straw. And big box retailers. Kohl's closed down because of all the theft and the amount of uh, money that they're losing, keeping their employees safe. Questions not just about whether we have enough police to catch criminals, but what happens after they're caught. The courts are overwhelmed. A result of that is going to be people who are not going to comply with their notice to appear or demand to appear. And so they just go on the run. Mexicans are fed up with the revolving door. What do we have to do to stop the revolving door? So this is about stopping the revolving door. We will put a wedge in the revolving door of violent crime in New Mexico. Action 7 News, News Radio KKOB and the Albuquerque Journal asking viewers, listeners and readers for their biggest concerns for our state. 1,100 of you answered. The overwhelming issue, crime. And joining us on the discussion tonight, some of those on the front lines of this fight, Attorney General Raul Torres, Bernalillo County District Attorney Sam Bregman, Bernalillo County Sheriff John Allen, and Nicole Chavez, whose son years ago was murdered. And helping lead our discussion, representing the Partners for Impact, Action 7 News anchor Shelley Rabando, from News Radio KKOB Mike Gaba, and from the Albuquerque Journal, Senior Vice President and Executive Editor Patrick Etheridge. Now, we did invite Governor Lujan Grisham to join our panel, but she declined. However, earlier today, you might have heard the governor did call a special session at the Roundhouse to focus on crime and public safety. That begins on July 18th. All right, let's begin our discussion with guns and drugs. These crimes are far too common in New Mexico, and they impact hundreds of families every day. Think about that. Hundreds of families every single day. Here's Sasha Linager. Two officers gunned down in the line of duty. An 11-year-old killed as he was leaving a baseball game. A 13-year-old in Cuesta shot and killed by another teen. And a New Mexico mall in chaos after two separate shootings. <laughs> These are just a few of the families impacted by gun crimes. The latest FBI data shows in 2022 in New Mexico, there were roughly 2,300 robberies. Firearms were involved in 47% of them. And 200 people were murdered. Guns were used in 73% of those. To speak to your child one day, and then the next day to find out that they're no longer here on this earth. It's devastating. The impact of gun violence is something Sally Sanchez feels every single day. My son, Antonio Jaramillo, was murdered in Albuquerque on December 16th of 2020 in his own home by five repeat offenders. Well, I lost my son to gun violence uh, in February of 2021. My youngest son was lured in, carjacked, kidnapped, and held for ransom. He took him to my oldest son's house and my oldest son went out to protect his brother and he was shot dead in front of his home. Alicia Otero also missing a piece of her heart. Both women say gun violence keeps getting worse. I also believe that uh, they're getting younger and accountability for juveniles is pretty much the bare minimum right now. Sanchez with a question for our panel. I'm going to direct this one at Sam Bregman and that would be why 
Are there so many plea deals that come out of your office when it comes to first degree murders, second degree murders? Um, you have the power for accountability and I don't understand why your office doesn't hold them accountable. First of all, I want to say that I spend so much of my time visiting with families of victims and it's a, it's a big part of our job because unfortunately we have far too much violent crime and people who have been killed by violent crime in our community. At the same time, so when you talk about first degree and second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter and going down the whole list, I want to point out that sometimes when, obviously when someone may be charged originally, they're an open count of murder, they may be indicted for first degree murder, but then all of a sudden witnesses aren't maybe so cooperative. Witnesses may go missing. Uh, witnesses um, don't recall the way they did before. And then evidence changes. My most important thing is to get the most justice we possibly can. I have a prosecutorial duty not to take a case to a jury that we do not believe we have a good faith basis to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And we will always hold that standard up when it comes to prosecution of crime. At the same time, we will do what we can to get the most justice we can. Oftentimes, that unfortunately for the victim's families results in a second degree charge instead of a first degree charge. And I know that tears the family apart and I appreciate it. And I understand it 100% my office does and the prosecutors and the, and the 10 prosecutors that do nothing but homicides in our office every single day feel that as well. I will tell you, for example, when I first came into office 14 months ago, there was over 50 homicides per prosecutor. We've added a number of prosecutors. We're down to 25 homicides per prosecutor, which means we get to supply juries with better prepared cases, and that's what justice is all about for us. And remember, the DA's job is to do justice. Always, that's what is in the forefront of our mind. Ms. Chavez, as a crime victim, what do you think about when you hear plea deal? Plea deals for me, I, I don't love, and it hurts my heart as a mother and a fellow victim. Um, we only went to trial for one of my son's murders out of three. Two got plea deals. Um, one, who was a juvenile, only spent one year in YDC. I don't think that's enough. He was the driver and the shooter. Spending one year behind bars is not okay with me. Um, at that time, it was two DAs ago, and I didn't even have a meeting with that district attorney to even talk to me about what was happening um, before they offered that. Um, the other one got 18 years, and I think they just did a news article in September. He got out after eight, after killing my son, and it was his entire idea. So when I have to visit my son at a gravesite uh, for his birthday, for a holiday, this morning on the way here. Um, one year, eight years for taking my son's life is not enough. And plea deals to us are not okay. And I understand sometimes because of the circumstances, they have to take them. But we will fight, I will fight until the day I die for my son and all of us feel the same way about our loved ones that were taken. And it just feels like sometimes that fight isn't taken all the way through the judicial system for us. And it feels like it fails us. Our next question <laughs> comes from Mike Gaba from KKOV Radio. Law enforcement agencies are spending millions of dollars on crime fighting technology like license plate uh, readers, shot spotter systems, uh, listening for gunfire. But what is actually working? And would that money be better spent on something as simple as boots on the ground? And Ms. Chavez, would ShotSpotter have made any difference in your particular incident? Um, in terms of license plate readers and ShotSpotter, we're going to be going with a different system. Uh, something that's very important to us is, yes, a ShotSpotter system is great to tell you where the casings are 
is great to tell you where the deceased body is, uh, but what was the last vehicle that came out of there, the last description of a subject? That's the technology and why I've been traveling so much to make sure that we're doing the correct technology to make sure that we're finding a description of the vehicle, uh, more information coming into law enforcement to either solve the case or prevent the case, and to make sure that we're also being fiscally responsible by looking at the systems that are not as expensive. Uh, I ask for capital outlay each year. I have to make sure that senators and representatives that are sitting here in the room, that what you're asking, that this technology will work. Um, we don't know exactly yet because we won't be implementing, implementing it until May. Um, we started seeing some of our license plate readers start to work that are popping up at some of the uh, private businesses. So we'll really have, for our technology and what we're buying, I'll really have a grip on that probably in the middle of the summer. I will tell you technology does work. Uh, you asked about boots on the ground. We're getting that. Our numbers are going up. But you have to also make sure that you're supplementing the lack of personnel that you have with technology. Uh, we can't be sitting in someone's driveway just for them to feel comfortable to see a law enforcement. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, we're going to a lot of priority one, two, or three calls. Uh, the sh sheriff's office, and I'll speak only for my agency, we're doing a lot of proactive policing. Uh, that just doesn't take time. It takes consistency, and we do need technology to supplement and to back our, our agency up to make sure that we're presenting the best cases. Ms. Chavez, could technology have helped your son? I don't think technology per se. I think it would have helped the case to find more casings. I know it was a very rainy, windy night. It was a mess, from what I hear, outside. Um, but I think what would help is more boots on the ground, like he said, we need officers. Um, officers are not wanting to take the job anymore or are retiring early. Why? I honestly think the DOJ agreement is really hurting us for law enforcement. I've heard that from police officers firsthand. Um, it, it holds their hands back from truly doing their job. I will say this, um, you know, from experience, my friend Michelle Webster, the widow of Dan, Web Dan Webster, she swears up and down that that DOJ agreement is what got Dan killed. Um, he hesitated for one moment, and when you hesitate on a violent repeat offender or criminal um, from putting their hands in handcuffs because you might hurt them because you might get written up, it affected him because he's no longer here today. Thank you. Now to the impact crime is having on everyone. Let's going to show you the results of our survey and 1,100 people responded. When asked of the issues facing New Mexicans, which do you think is most important? Nearly half said crime was most important. Another 20% said it was second. Another question, what are the biggest obstacles standing in the way of accomplishing goals for you and your family? More than a third said crime. Also, what forms of assistance would you and your family find most helpful? More than a third said improved public safety. And if you could plan the future of New Mexico, what would your primary focus be? 40% said increasing safety and reducing crime. And finally, looking 25 years into the future, which version of New Mexico would you most like to see? Nearly half said a safer place with less violence. As Anchor Brianna Albizu shows us right now, New Mexico's crime problem is affecting businesses and all aspects of our economy. We're just, we're just coming out of our busy season. For Donna Buffett, community means everything. That's why, as the co-owner of Buffett's Candies, she stays busy, especially as she manages a second location. We we're very blessed to get the building that we have on Academy and it has been completely remodeled. But with any shop comes a need for safety. And unfortunately, her original location on Lomas has seen its fair share of problems. It's really changed over the last 10 years. You know, there's there's been some issues here, but really in the last 10 years, and it's been extremely highlighted in the last two to three years. A lot of homelessness, a lot of a lot of crime. That's why Buffett had to make some major security changes and it's cost her a pretty penny. We have actually spent quite a bit of money putting up the fence around the perimeter so that we can protect our staff and our customers. But usually stuff like that would happen overnight. We wouldn't notice like someone throwing a rock at the window or whatever. A similar bill for Ethan Harrison, his store Astro Zombies displaying a new metal screen to fight off thieves. But that's just on the outside. Someone tried to shoplift. I don't remember what item it was. It was some it was some kind of toy or something. And um, the other manager stopped him at the door. Um, and then the guy got upset with the manager and he pushed him like physically pushed him over. They're all real fears for business owners nowadays and business leaders are fed up. It's to the point now where many businesses are just giving up. They don't want to operate here anymore and 
that breaks my heart. The concerns so dire that the coalition is actually considering a lawsuit against the city of Albuquerque. They're basically saying they're planning to sue city leaders for not doing enough to protect businesses, and they say it is not about the money. It is specifically about the city enforcing existing laws and taking care of the people that live here, keeping us safe on our streets and in our homes. They say it's going to take a lot of work at many levels to change it. From new crime legislation at the Roundhouse to more police patrolling the streets and better resources for those in hard times. Places where people can you know, help get off addictions, affordable housing, you know, stuff like that, where people can get off the streets. All to preserve the many joys of New Mexico. And it's really a shame because Albuquerque is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And cities big and small. I understand we don't have enough men and women serving and we need more, but we need to empower the people we do have serving, allow them to do their job, allow them to protect the people and the city that they love. When is that going to happen? I think it, it can absolutely happen, but again, we have to start focusing and listening to the people who um, are, are dealing with these challenges day in and day out. Mo most people in most communities um, aren't consumed with the issues of crime and public safety because it fades into the background, right? It's something that gets dealt with by professionals who are properly supported and properly resourced. and. Um, you know, this is what happens when we prioritize things at the expense of um, a real deep understanding and appreciation for what is actually happening at street level. Every single year before I went up to the legislature as district attorney, we would have a, a whole slate of legislative proposals and I would invite members of the legislature to come to the office and listen. And I would get a handful every single year. Um, how many of your representatives and senators, and I, and I see some here today, some who deserve great credit, Representative Marion Matthews um, carried a bill every year for rebuttable presumptions, and she took the time to listen. Um, how many of, of our representatives and senators have gone on a swing shift in the Southeast Area Command or with one of the deputies in the South Valley to actually see what it's like? And then a couple of days later, come in to D.A. Bregman's office and see what happens. Do you have all the information that you need? Do you get it in a timely fashion? Are we able to meet the deadlines imposed by the court? And then if we, if we do everything correct, right, we do everything right, where does this individual end up? You know, Nicole talked earlier about accountability. If, if people who are committing even low-level offenses are back on the street before our officers are done with their shift, we're sending a message to the community about accountability and we're sending a message to them that nothing matters, that there will be no consequences and we can't live in that, that society. We have to focus our energy and effort on that. But I wanna make one other point. It is absolutely true, I believe, that we don't have enough police officers to deal with what, what we are confronted with, with compliance with DOJ, with the unique features of our criminal justice system. We are several hundred officers short of what we need. But if you ask Chief Hebby, it isn't just about money. We can throw a lot of money at this problem. It's about taking a step back and thinking about what kind of public servants and police officers we want. When I grew up in this community, there was a, a respect and appreciation for police officers that is missing now. And, and I understand how we got to that place. My office is prosecuting officers for violating their oath and doing things that, I, that violate the law. And my commitment is to hold them accountable. But that doesn't mean we should paint the entire profession with a brush that minimizes their work and their sacrifice. Um, we do need support. Uh, we see a lot of the negative things and connotations that go on. You can, I'll speak for my agency alone. We had three arrests here in the last three or four months. Um, that doesn't help public trust. But what that does and why people ask me why I apologize to the community and so many other agencies is that puts a huge black eye on law enforcement. We have a focus here in the metro area, but all over New Mexico and all over the nation. But it also overshadows the great and awesome work our other deputies and officers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that pisses them off, and that pisses me off. Excuse the language, but I'm very upfront 
Um, we need support. Uh, but at the same time, we don't make excuses. We, we have the alacrity to make sure that we're going to move forward. Um, for me, and I told uh, my deputies, I don't care if you arrest them 9, 10, 11, 12 times. You keep doing your job every day. You keep being seen in the community. You keep doing your community outreach. You keep making an arrest over and over. You keep doing early intervention, all the programs that we're bringing, and you go over and over again. And eventually, and we're starting to see it a little bit, the criminal justice system will understand, and the judges will understand also to hold people accountable. But communication from all four of us up here at the table is key. And our next question from the panel comes from Patrick Etheridge from the Albuquerque Journal. Are existing laws and penalties adequate to deter and prosecute organized retail crime? Should there be specific legislation targeting these crimes? And what penalties should be imposed? Mr. Torres. So I think this is one area where we've made some progress in the legislature. They passed uh, a bill recently to enhance penalties for organized retail crime um, that allows us to aggregate offenses across um, multiple stores, multiple locations. I think it's too early to t tell, quite frankly, um, whether or not those are going to be adequate, and it's something that we'll probably have to revisit. I think one of the, the bigger issue from my perspective is the availability uh, and, the, and the deadly mix of narcotics and firearms that are accessible to young people. Um, and, and here's an example of I think a well-intentioned piece of legislation that I support, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be a, have a big impact on public safety. The, the legislature recently passed a seven-day waiting period for firearms, and I think that's going to have some marginal um, impact on people who may use a firearm to commit suicide. I don't, however, think it's going to have any meaningful impact on the availability of, of guns that are used in crimes because most of the people, I think, I think the sheriff and the DA will agree, that commit violent crimes using firearms aren't going to Cabela's, they're not going to Sportsman's Warehouse, they're not waiting for their seven-day background check. You know what they're doing? They're going on Snap and Telegram and social media applications and buying and selling and trading um, guns right now. And a lot of our homicides are connected to those interactions. People get ambushed selling a gun, buying a gun, or trading for narcotics. And it's moving further and further into our younger population. That's why you see so many offenders there. And so it's not that I, I don't want to focus on organized retail crime, but if I am dealing with a legislative body or policymakers that need to be focused on the most impactful things, I want them to focus on that. I feel like we're embracing this new normal and adjusting our lives to the criminals instead of them adjusting to us because we're not holding them accountable. Like he said, you go to Walgreens and everything's locked up. If I go to my Smiths on Wyoming and Paseo after seven o'clock, one of the exits is closed. And we're just adjusting to it like it's normal. Um, for the guns, for instance, the seven day waiting period, I don't think that's gonna help crime at all. Um, but yes, it would help suicide. I don't think that the laws they're trying to pass saying that it's going to help our crime issue, trying to take the guns away or ban guns is gonna help either. Um, the three individuals that killed my son all had guns illegally because they're criminals. They found them off the streets. They traded them for drugs at a party a day or a week before. Um, it, it's not holding them accountable and they're not gonna follow the law because criminals don't follow the law. You're just taking them away from law abiding citizens like myself um, or, or people that want to you know, protect themselves. We recently talked to Doug Peterson who owns retail properties throughout New Mexico and he says he spends $200,000 a year on security for his most troubled properties. How much responsibility and cost should businesses be expected to pay and take on to protect the property and how much do they expect from law enforcement for protection? Obviously, we're seeing this problem throughout our community and we have been for some time now. It is unacceptable retail crime Organized crime, property damage to businesses um, is unacceptable at every single level. I will tell you uh, that law enforcement, and we've just had this conversation, is stretched pretty thin, but that's no excuse. We need to do whatever we can to make, make businesses 
and this community safer. I just want to touch base on this organized retail crime question that we just had before. I want folks to know that to the, I want to compliment the legislature on passing that organized retail crime bill um, a couple of sessions ago. Because, because of that bill, we've charged 75, in the DA's office, since that bill became law. We have charged 75 people with aggregated shoplifting felonies, 49 people for aggravated shoplifting, 11 people for organized retail crime. We have entered now on every misdemeanor case 474 cases we have entered on in the DA's office in this county alone, which I want folks to understand is that this office and I think law enforcement in general, and we work together with various operations, understand businesses, the, the suffering that goes on, the economic loss, but also every single person that wants to go into the Smiths at Wyoming Paseo or anywhere in this town and sees things locked up at Walgreens or whatever, that that crime itself affects every individual. I hear all the issues and the problems and answer one of your questions, how much should they invest in security? I mean, I think you should always protect your property to however how you feel as a business owner. Um, but after I talked to Mr. Peterson, he's uh, spending way too much. That's what he pays taxes for. That's what we're responsible for. Uh, I don't like to make excuses. I look for solutions. Um, I'm in charge of the unincorporated areas. If, if everyone has noticed, I've been moving more into the city areas. I'm not, I can only speak for my agency. I see and hear you. Um, it's Bernalillo County. I'm the chief law enforcement here for it. Uh, the solution that would be is to have my deputies uh, move into incorporated areas. I get calls from business owners and constituents on a nightly basis. From Mr. Peterson himself, we make sure we directly try to go and solve his problems. I just passed by Central and San Pedro, and I saw some things I didn't like, and we'll be addressing that as soon as we leave here. Um, later here, in about two or three months, I will be creating probably the first ever the metro unit for the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office uh, to make sure that we are proactive and that we are being a force multiplier. I can't speak for APD. I wish they could do more, but at this point, that is up to the chief and the mayor. I can only do what I can do to make sure that those uh, solutions come to fruition. Crime victims and law enforcement have been frustrated by instances of suspects arrested and released quickly. We've already addressed this a little bit. As John Carnelli shows us, in some cases, those suspects have committed other crimes while they're out awaiting trial. Devin Hayborn's smile has been the same since day one. It's a smile that Devin's mother, Angel O'Leary, could no longer see. Angel, if you could have one phone call with your son, what would you want to tell him? But I just want that one last definite chance to tell him that I'm proud of him and that I love him. On April 21st, 2021, Angel received a call that her son had been murdered. It was later discovered Devin Munford killed Hayborn after the two got into a fight over a gun Hayborn owned. Munford has been found guilty of the crime. They basically knew each other for six weeks before he was killed. During those six weeks, Munford was wearing an ankle monitor because he had been arrested four months earlier for shooting out the window of his car. A motion was filed to try and keep him behind bars until trial, but instead he was let out with that monitor. At trial, it was revealed Munford had violated his ankle monitor 113 times before he killed Hayborn. What happened to Angel's son is what some refer to as the revolving door, a term often used to describe the crime problem in the state of New Mexico. The revolving door, per se, is our deputy goes and arrests someone for a crime and two hours later or the next morning that they're let out in jail and we deal with them again on the same crime, if not something else. In 2024, a law was proposed to try and put an end to the revolving door by establishing what's called rebuttable presumption. I'm proposing not only a new constitutional amendment, but a statutory change that would say the uh, defendant would have to prove he's not a danger to uh, society and can be released. Right now, it is the state that must prove that. But that law didn't pass. In total, both chambers of the legislature passed 17 bills related to crime. One requires gun buyers to wait seven days after a purchase to receive a gun. 
Another allots $35 million to recruit state and local police officers, including prison guards and probation officers. And one bill even increased the penalty for second-degree murder from 15 to 18 years. There's other crimes on the books that are 18 years that are simply not as bad as secondary murder. So now first-degree murder and secondary murder are the one and two worst penalties in the criminal code. Everybody has going to have to come together to make sure that we know who and what we're voting for, that we demand the change that we need, and that we demand stricter penalties. What should priorities be to get enough legislation, effective legislation, through to better protect everyone watching and their families? Mr. Bregman, we'll start with you. One thing I can tell you is we need to increase the penalty or make it mandatory for of felons in possession, felons who have already been convicted as a felon, who use a firearm again, brandishing a firearm or actually using it in the commission of crime, we should have a mandatory penalty for that. I truly believe that we cannot continue to allow folks n to, to commit crimes that have already been convicted as felons and not suffer any consequences oftentimes, and that's unacceptable. I will tell you the other focus that I would really think could go a tremendously long way when it comes to our fight against fentanyl, which is at the root of so much crime in our community, that poison out on the streets that is, that is destroying neighborhoods and destroying human beings, is we need to have a real, truly robust system when it comes to uh, mental health and addiction treatment and perhaps forcing addicts at some point to get treatment and also providing the resources. We currently divert close to 3,000 people this year out of the criminal justice system because they would not have committed a crime were it not for the fact that they were that their addiction. So we divert them out to get treatment, get the treatment, get yourself better, that way you won't be back in the criminal justice system and there's not enough treatment out there. One of the hardest things that we do as prosecutors is meet with, with family members. Um, I remember meeting Nicole for the first time. I remember meeting Angel the first time. And it is hard enough to look those families in the eye when something random happens. It is inexcusable that her killer was out on the street. It is inexcusable. And it is a failing of our system. It is our failing of our institutions. And it is unacceptable that somebody who was caught in the middle of the night with drugs and a gun, and he's firing it out of the window, and we arrest him, and we move to detain him, and he's let out, we put him on an ankle monitor, he, he violates that monitoring system a hundred times in a matter of weeks. Do you know how many times we were notified that that happened? Zero. None. We found out after the fact that they weren't monitoring people on nights and weekends, because I guess criminals don't work on nights and weekends. He kills Devin. He goes on a crime spree. We arrest him again. Guess what? We bring him back in. We move to detain him a second time. And the Arnold Risk Assessment Tool recommends that the judge let him out again. And I go to the legislature, and, I, and I'm so sick and tired of listening to statisticians and criminologists tell me that this is not having an impact on crime. The hell it isn't. We have to close the revolving door and we have to stop making excuses for it. Policymakers in Santa Fe created this situation. Policymakers in Santa Fe can fix this situation. They just have to do it. I think we need to fix bail reform. I've been fighting along with Raul for the last five years, even when he's the district attorney trying to fight for this. They're saying it's the constitutional rights of a criminal. We need to find a middle ground to figure that out. I believe it needs to go back on the ballot. We have to fight, fight that through Santa Fe first. We all voted on it several years ago. I think we were tricked into it. They didn't tell us anything about the Arnold tool. They just told us we needed the constitutional amendment so we wouldn't hold poor people behind bars. This is not what happened. They are making 
it feel like the judges have to look at that Arnold tool before making those decisions themselves. That was the first thing I would fix. The second thing I would say is they need crime education on drugs and firearms in school. I remember growing up with D.A.R.E. I'm sure all of you did. Um, they actually educated students. We need to educate them now. It's getting more dangerous. Drugs are everywhere. I had a nephew that overdosed on fentanyl last year. I had to leave the session for a couple weeks. It was heartbreaking. He was a state wrestler. We think those things don't happen. It's happening to all of us. But we're not educating these students in the classrooms. And then last but not least, three strikes. And I know everybody fights on that in Santa Fe. I've been fighting on that for eight years. I think the three strikes that was created in the 90s is old. We worked tirelessly on just adjusting the three strikes rule to only include the most violent offenses. We're talking murder, attempted murder, rape. If somebody is convicted of that three times, you are telling me that the third time they shouldn't be behind bars for life. We want them back on the streets. And you say it's crazy when we go to Santa Fe, these legislators look at us and say, well, they're not going to get out anyway. They will. We're in New Mexico. Alicia's son just, he's, he got sentenced to 29 years for killing two people. My son's murderer killed someone six months after killing Jaden. He's behind bars for 42 years and then gets out. They go in young, they come out. Why should they not be held behind bars for the rest of their life? I don't care how much it costs, costs, um, costs the state. It costs us, as people that are looking at grave sites for our loved ones, a lot more than $30,000 a year, and it's going to keep affecting us for the rest of our lives. We need to hold them accountable. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Patrick Etheridge from the Albuquerque Journal. Patrick. This question is from Alicia Otero, who you saw in the setup piece. Her son was murdered in 2021, and her question to you all was, again, how do you decide who gets a plea deal who goes to trial, and how does that work? Mr. Bregman, you touched on that a little bit. Much of the time, the courts decide who goes to trial because obviously they set the calendar for their particular courts. We have 14,000 cases referred to our office from law enforcement every single year. Just this morning, for example, just to give you an idea, 33 cases were referred to our office this morning, nine possession of fentanyl or controlled substance, one trafficking case, just to give you an example, some shoplifting, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, all those cases. We tried more cases last year than any, than in any time in the last five years. We had more convictions of felonies than any time in the last five years of violent crime, of sexual assaults, I'm very proud of the fact that our office, at every single week you can see courtrooms filled up with juries and specifically with prosecutors and defendants and defense counsel doing justice. And that's what's something we'll continue to do. We obviously plead cases when, when cases, when we see a need to do justice, for example, this case, and oftentimes, we may offer a plea and the defense doesn't take it and we try that case. That happens all the time. It also happens so often that we have a case that didn't look as good as it did when it first came in. And maybe the lesser charge is the charge that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt, but not the first charge. And that's not the fault of law enforcement or in their investigation necessarily. That's just what happens when it comes to prosecution of cases. When you're a year later or six months to 18 months later, Things change in cases, but we focus on holding people accountable under the rule of law. Sheriff Allen, your men and women collect evidence. You think it's a strong case. You present it to the DA's office. They think it's a strong case. But then days or weeks later, you hear plea deal. What do you think about that? I listened to a jail phone call the other evening on a gentleman that we arrested for a violent crime against a person, and it was a stabbing knowing that he's not worried about it because he is going to get credit time served and that when he does go to trial, he knows most likely that he might get a plea deal. We have failed. So we have all the questions. I'm trying to bring solutions. We need to make sure that we're holding these criminals accountable. Nobody here, folks, criminals, is scared. If the feds are involved, they tell you, crud, we got to watch out for them. The state's involved, 
they know not much is going to, 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 to affect them at all. The special session, representative senators, I see you in here, we are the experts in law enforcement. Men and women out here in uniform are the experts in law enforcement. Instead of a statistician being at your table all the time, have us at the table, please. If I could give the legislature one piece of unsolicited advice, and they usually don't solicit my advice anyway. Um, the sheriff's right. Look at the federal system. Look at the fe I've, I've worked on both sides of Lomas. If I'm on the north side of Lomas and I'm walking into U.S. District Court and you have a felony and a gun, I know what's going to happen. And more importantly, he knows what's going to happen. I, your, your question about plea agreements is well taken, but he, here's something you probably aren't really thinking about, and I know the community isn't thinking about. 95% of federal cases are resolved by plea, but there is a vast difference in the kind of bargaining power that prosecutors have in the state system versus the federal system because of detention, because of the guidelines, because of the judge, because of discretion. It is a totally different world. So unless the entire federal government's been violating the United States Constitution for the last 40 years, somebody's been feeding policymakers in Santa Fe bad information. But the difference is that system has not been reorganized repetitively to serve the interests of criminal defendants. The vast majority of people we send to prison, whether it's state court or federal court, the story of their life is always the same. Trauma, addiction, neglect, abuse, a mother or a grandmother trying to hold things together, discipline in a, in a schoolroom, right? Expulsion from a school. Then they show up in the streets and we get asked about what we're gonna do to police our way out of it, prosecute our way out of it. I will do and these gentlemen will do what you expect us to do as community leaders. If someone shows up with a gun, and brandishes it and threatens a member of your family or mine, I'm gonna take them and try to put them away and take them off of our streets. But let's not forget to ask the next question, which is what was going on in that person's life in the 20 years before that happened? We have to be able to talk about accountability and prevention at the same time and not get tangled up in the politics of, of one side versus the other. And we have to just focus on all of these issues. I hope the special session gives us that opportunity. When we see a plea deal happen, it's like our loved ones didn't matter, their lives didn't matter, it only, it only mattered for two years of somebody's time. Um, look at my good friend Veronica, baby Lily was shot. They were hold, they were, he was held accountable because of federal court. Look at my dear friend Sam B. Hill for his wife Jackie. They were held accountable on the federal side before we finally went through uh, the trial to hold them liable. And when we're throwing plea deals out that are just holding somebody responsible. This is Jaden. This is the last picture he took his junior year of high school. You're telling me that his life was only worth one year for a juvenile offender. You're telling me that his life was only worth eight years from one of his murderers that just walked out of prison. No. It's not enough, and that's why it affects us as loved ones. Well, we've all heard about crimes that are shocking. We just heard a few more from Ms. Chavez right there, maybe even more so when serious crimes are committed by children, as she also mentioned. Faith Ibuano looks at the dramatic spike in kids becoming criminals. Youth violence, juvenile crime. Oh, right in front of the cops, are you serious? Just one of many pressing issues plaguing New Mexico in recent years. The youth today, unfortunately, in New Mexico are absolutely out of control. A shootout in downtown Albuquerque just last month. Bystanders capturing the chaotic scene on video. He's talking, bro. Two teens arrested, charged, and booked into jail. Knockouts nightclub is closed for now. A story we first brought to you is breaking news last month after police say a 16-year-old killed a man inside. That 16-year-old now charged with murder following the Delhi shooting earlier this year. I can tell you that Albuquerque is probably one of the roughest markets that we work in, and this is our home base. Uh, we travel all over the country and we operate all over the country. Evacuations at Coronado Center five months ago. You guys exit that door. Keep your hands up in case uh, sheriffs is out there. A 
a 15-year-old turning himself into authorities after police say he fired a shot inside. Police say an altercation with another teen was the root cause. They did a foot pursuit, chased him out of the mall, and he is able to escape at this point. His parents telling us their son was a victim of bullying. He just was freaked out, and he was just like, Mom, help me. What am I going to do? Like, you know, he's like, this, you know, everything happened so fast. These kids are running around with, you know, all kinds of guns. Uh, because they think they can, because there's no consequence. Staggering amounts of juvenile arrest. Data from the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office shows concerning numbers over the past three years. Our numbers are all of a sudden shooting up. The number of juvenile arrests doubling in 2022 with 82 arrests from just 42 in 2021, jumping again in 2023 to 126. That's three times the number from two years ago. Now we're getting youth that are staying upwards or our average daily stay is at or around, let's say, 60 plus days. So you can see how that's all of a sudden increased. A lot of our kids are homeless. They're living on the streets. Um, and what avenue do they kind of have to turn to? They have one another. Unfortunately, they sometimes just kind of go down that wrong path. Stanley Gray with the Bernalillo County Detention Youth Center now calling on state leaders to be proactive with resources before it's too late. What else are we able to do now? So I think starting at an earlier age and kind of just educating everybody from the kids all the way up to parents, whatever things we can kind of do to just provide them as much knowledge as we can. And Mr. Bregman, we already heard from the panel, criminals are not born criminals. It either starts in the home or very close to the home. How can that be proactively addressed? There are absolutely no consequences, none, none right now for juveniles who commit crimes without, let's say, murder or a gun crime. Let's say you steal a car right now in Bernalillo County and you're 16 years old. The chances of you spending one night in the detention home, zero. There are no consequences for juveniles. So as was said earlier, if you're a, it's Parenting 101, if you do this, there's gonna be this consequence. If you do this and you say there's gonna be this consequence, but there is no consequence, what do they do? They ratchet it up to the next level. And so eventually, eventually the only thing we do in our juvenile justice system right now in Bernalillo County is hold p kids who use firearms in crimes the least bit accountable. But I certainly, in this 60-day session coming up, I implore us as a community, as a state, all of us to work together. The Children's Code was done in the 1970s when kids used to get in a fist fight in the backside of school. Now they drive around with bags of fentanyl and stolen Kias and shoot out the window because they think it's cool because they got some likes on social media and those bullets end up going into a house and killing another kid. The, the times have changed. The Children's Code has to change with it. Juveniles are the drivers of crime in Bernalillo County. Uh, juveniles are also the drivers of crime across the nation. Just came back from the FBI Academy in Quantico and met with 52 sheriffs and chiefs from all around the world, and they're seeing it also overseas. Uh, this is something where I really bifurcate things in terms of holding people accountable for gun crimes, violent crimes. YSC is at 51. I also see Tanya Covington out in the crowd that really cares about the youth. Um, it's also about early intervention with juveniles. We see the family dynamic and the juveniles tell us. Juveniles that commit a violent crime that are murdering, they need to be held accountable. All of the warning signs that we see with children that are coming up stealing cars, 51 at YSC. Uh, the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, we have not even targeted juveniles right now. We are trying to warn YSC that we are about to start a program named ECHO, and it's Engage, Contact, Help, and Outreach. And that's specifically um, for our juveniles that I'll be talking to uh, Ms. Chavez about here in May. And we know that when we start targeting, we're going to see more crime. Our deputies are running into stolen vehicles, and the DA is correct. Uh, we have four juveniles in a, in a vehicle. It's stolen, and there's firearms, there's narcotics, there's fentanyl, and everything else in there. YSC will not accept them unless they either shot and killed someone, or maybe if they fired a firearm out of a window. That's a problem. That's a system that has failed our youth, and it has failed just not here in Bernalillo County, but the state of New Mexico. So we need to make sure that we're early intervening and also catching these drivers of crime and juveniles. That you're right, Doug, they are not afraid. They know they're gonna get out. They tell our deputies, and they just had another case last week, 
and I had a good little yelling match with the county manager and the person who runs YSC because I'm tired of it. They know they're going to get out, and the next day they're doing the exact same crime. That's the truly revolving door of the juvenile system in the state of New Mexico. And Ms. Chavez, your son, a juvenile, killed by at least one other juvenile. It's extremely frustrating. It's emotionally exhausting. I feel like a broken record for the last eight and a half years. The juvenile crime is getting out of control. It's getting out of control because we don't hold them accountable, because they keep getting away. So their behavior becomes more and more violent. We have a budget right now that can afford to open more facilities for substance abuse and behavioral health, and we need to. Where's the excuses for that? It should be mandatory. If, if they won't go to YDC or we don't want to keep them behind bars, let's do something that will help them. I can scream till I'm blue in the face about penalties. You know how I feel. I think penalties should fit the crime. But also what I've heard, because I do talk to the incarcerated, I go and talk to juveniles at YDC and give them impact statements about how it affected my family. It's a butterfly effect when you take away a family and a life. I talk to the incarcerated in adult prisons, and you know what I hear? I hear some people that have truly changed, that have gotten an education, um, and it's not mandatory, we should make it mandatory, that have truly changed because they saw hope. But when did they see that hope? When they were held accountable behind bars because they're not learning those things at home then if the only thing that's teaching them is to be incarcerated, why is that a problem? If we're not giving these programs in schools, why is that a problem? And most importantly with these juveniles, why are we not holding parents accountable? We have no problem saying they should be accountable when it involves a gun, but when it's any other charge, why are we not holding parents accountable? for the actions of their children if they're not trying to help. I also know parents that have contacted police or law enforcement or DA saying, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle my child, help me. There's nothing that the state has to help these parents either. We have to find avenues for each of these issues to truly, truly address this problem. There was a 16 year old kid who was caught with a weapon, I believe at West Mesa High School. And you, it's on the Pell video, you can watch the APD officer putting in a phone call to the juvenile probation officer who manages the intake for that facility. And you can hear to their astonishment that the JPPO officer has put this child into their risk assessment tool, decided they're not a risk, and told to let them go. So the Albuquerque police officer cuts them loose the day after the Uvalde shooting. No notion of where the kid got the gun, what's happening in the home, what's going to happen if the kid comes back. Accountability matters. Because here's the thing. What do you think that 16-year-old told his friends at school the next day? I got caught with a gun. They had me in the back of a patrol unit. And then what happened? Oh, they let me go. You don't think that has an impact on everyone else in that school? Now, I'm not saying that that young person is irredeemable or we should throw them in jail, you know, put them in jail and throw away the key. That's not what I'm saying. But there has to be a consequence attached to it. There has to be. And the second point is this. It is not a coincidence that this state leads the country in violent crime and also leads the country in adverse childhood experiences and trauma for children. We are through the roof in repeat, re repeat maltreatment of children. If you went and did a, an ACEs score, a trauma inventory of the 51 people that DA Bregman just talked about, I guarantee you that CYFD has been called to the home, not when they were 16 and 17, but when they were three and four and five. That's why a broken CYFD and child welfare system is catastrophic, not just for those children today, but for this community 10 or 15 or 20 years down the line. Most of what we do is deal with the people who have been victimized and traumatized and witnessed abuse and violence as children. They don't get any help, they don't get any intervention, they don't get anything. 
and they do the predictable thing. We would like to give each of our panelists the time to say a final comment or argument. Mr. Torres, why don't you start us off? I want people who are watching this and participating in the event to recognize that for all of the problems and all of the challenges and all of the frustration that you hear voiced by, by members of this panel and members of the community, there's hope we can fix this. This is not an unsolvable problem. It is the basic fundamental obligation of government to provide safety to its citizens. That is the first duty of government. And we have, we are fortunate enough to have a blueprint from other states, from the federal system, from our own past history. We have the ability to get this done. This is not an unsolvable problem. We just have to listen and be open to having difficult conversations. And I implore people in this community and across the state to let people in positions of power know. I, I hear it. I know the sheriff hears it, the DA hears it. That in, comes in the nature of a public service, the good and bad and otherwise. But you cannot throw up your hands in frustration. We need your help. We need your support. We need your engagement. Thank you. Mr. Bregman. I am really appreciative of the fact that we had this town hall today to discuss the realities of crime on the, flo uh, on the ground and in this community. It is a, such a serious problem. But at the same time, I also don't want to miss the opportunity to tell the people of Bernalillo County that they have 300 people, including over 100 prosecutors at the district attorney's office, that work their tails off every single day to try and make this community safer. In the last 14 months, for example, they have tried more felony cases than, than we can, we can get, look back and find any year that even compares to it. The convicted more felons of violent crime. We've, we've started new things like a gun team to focus on 18 to 25 year olds. The fact of the matter is every single day, our office together with law enforcement work together to make this community safer. And I know that people may not see it right away but this is a big ship in the ocean that we need to turn around. And we are turning, it takes time. By no means do we not have so much more work to do, because we do, in getting a handle on everything from shoplifting to violent crime, to fentanyl, to juvenile crime, to juveniles with guns, all of those things, we're gonna continue to grind it out every single day. Thank you. Sheriff Allen. We're working together but we want to make sure we keep those communication avenues left open. We need to address the drivers of crime juvenile with the juvenile code, I'm telling you. Um, we need to look at penalties. We need to look at programs for children. Had another call last night. There's not, any, not enough programs for our, our children at all here in Bernalillo County, and that's for the whole state. I just can't speak for here in the metro area. Um, but marrying, I re would really like lawmakers to look at marrying the federal justice system in certain avenues. Uh, because that's what is needed to curb crime. We've been talking about this for a while. Uh, but I would like to have a seat at the table, all of us would, uh, for any of these discussions for the special session. I believe I called for one almost a year ago, and I'm glad that one has finally came up front in July to address criminal issues, but also the behavioral health system. Uh, I believe even Farmington doesn't have a, they have to drive a long way for um, any type of help. Uh, we need a system that is current and that is used by the whole state and it's used by everybody, so we're all on the same page to curb not only juveniles, but all of the behavioral